all to the fourth annual national student conference on noble connect redefining the world to literature let us begin this day with an invitation There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Good morning to all who are present over here. The fourth edition of our annual national conference is on Noble Connect. Noble Connect redefining the world through the literature. Generally, Writers use literature as a forum to analyze or ponder the world and its political, social, and cultural challenges. By highlighting the significant topics that appeal to readers worldwide, writers who have made unique contributions to literature are honored with the Nobel Prize in Literature. According to Nobel Prize organization, the annual prize in literature is given to the person who shall have produced in the field of literature the most outstanding work in an ideal direction and was the fourth reward area named in Alfred Nobel's will. 120 literature laureates and 116 literature awards have been given out. The wide range of works that are selected for the Nobel Prize in literature is evidence of the diversity of human experience and viewpoints from different cultures. While some writers focus on philosophical issues, others investigate the nuances of interpersonal interactions and human emotions. Some writers explore historical occurrences or societal shifts in their writings, providing perspectives on the past and how it affects the present. This conference provides platform for students to choose any Nobel Prize winning works or author and present a detailed research paper with emphasis both on the nature of work and its contribution towards redefining the world. The conference focuses on students to draw the outstanding works of Nobel Prize winning writers of the world in depth and with intensity. Also, they can create awareness among the young minds the contribution of the Nobel laureates in literature and discuss the impact of their works on humankind. 
looking forward to hear from you all thank you thank you may now request head department of english mrs pina thomas to give her opening remarks and to introduce the keynote speaker thank you kritika good morning to one and all and greetings from the pg and research department of ctt college and we are once again happy to be hosting the national student conference and this time on noble connect redefining the world through literature this annual event started as a state conference 7 years back and post covid it became a national conference and as a national co conference this is the fourth edition at the outset may i congratulate all the students all the student participants presenters who have taken time to read research and present their work today i hope on the outcome that we are looking for from this research uh from this conference and the research that went into it from your side is that you will do more of it and you will be more hungry for research and for reading and also uh what to say go and discover what exactly literature is doing to redefine this world now this idea of this conference uh to some extent uh, ashia had just uh, briefed us and uh, in fact this idea of this conference came up as a uh, as a venture to find out an answer to the question what is the contribution of nobel uh, prize in literature or what are the nobel writers nobel prize winner winning writers contributing to this world because when it is an award for peace or economics or science there seem to be a concrete contribution so when a nobel prize in literature is announced there is a doubt around what exactly is a contribution and that is exactly what we would like to find or make ourselves aware and many others aware or awaken ourselves to what exactly are these writings doing to redefine this world definitely the nobel prize for literature has played a significant role i would say even to begin with in the concept of storytelling the power of words to influence uh, human culture society uh, say, and also in the advancement of arts promoting cultural understanding and diversity and definitely uh, the writers uh, the nobel laureates have used their writing uh, to write about difficult social issues like racism inequality oppression all these gained attention through their writings and uh, the nobel laureates have focused uh, you know their a light on the issues that are influence our real reality a realistic world and they have their writings have made a significant contribution no doubt to the promotion of uh, cross cultural understanding preservation of cultural heritage particularly those that came from africa and all those parts of the world so literature is uh, all over the world has been uh, like you know therefore uh, recognized by this prize and exposing readers to a variety of cultures traditions and points of view many of us who saw the world through these writings and books can vouch for the statement so this is uh, what the nobel prize in literature is all about and the nobel laureates uh, the contribution that they have been making a profound appreciation for diversity dismantling of cultural barriers advancement of a world making it more tolerant and inclusive therefore looking into them looking into their writings at this point of time in the world uh, is i mean a uh, point of time where the world is going through a lot of uh, disharmony makes more sense as well so when we look at the writers there are many to name but there are names like faulkner or hemingway and definitely marcus gabriel garcia marcus and tony morrison and ishiguro who will stand the test of time who continue to be studied and celebrated and i don't think the world can ever forget what they have done to redefine this world uh, to quote uh, shoinka himself um, a nobel laureate and a dramatist uh, books and all forms of writing he said are terror to those who wish to suppress the truth 
So 1986 Nobel laureate uh, Shoinka said this, and that is a, that is a truth that books can never suppress the truth or they keep truth going alive. And another quote by my Nobel laureate, which I felt is relevant uh, today, uh, is from the Chinese, Chinese and France, I think is both, uh, Gao Zinjian, uh, 2000 Nobel laureate, how he spoke about language being the ultimate crystallization of human civilization. So he points out how language is intricate, incisive, and difficult to grasp, yet pervasive and therefore penetrates human perceptions and links man, the perceiving subject, to his own understanding of the world. This, I feel, definitely defines what literature has been doing in redefining this world. Uh, to, I, I think when we mention the Nobel laureates, very often Bob Dylan's name comes up the 2016 Nobel Prize winner. And very often, uh, the, I mean, it did le lead to a lot of questions, a lot of thinking. Can a song be literature? If not, why not? And you know, concepts like that. But even that, you know, set, a pro set about an inter interesting perspective uh, to the world and redefined perhaps even our own perceptions about literature. So therefore, there is so much that we can research and there's so much that we can uh, talk about. And that is what we wanted the students to explore. And we are waiting to hear from the papers. All, already we have had the pleasure of reading some of them. And we are waiting to listen to each one of you. Once again, congratulations and welcome, dear students. This conference would, have, would not have been complete but for the presence of a distinguished speaker, Dr. Pratik. Uh, the department, the college and the department wholeheartedly thank you, uh, dear sir, for accepting our invitation. It was so spontaneous and your presence here makes this conference so meaningful. And the topic of your uh, keynote uh, speech today is going to be an added, uh, what to say, an advantage to all of us here because he's going to speak on the 2023 Nobel laureate Yon um, She, and therefore it's going to be a really interesting uh, uh, opening to the, uh, uh, to the conference today. So a warm welcome to you, Professor, and welcome to this conference. Uh, I also welcome our principal, the student paper presenters, and all the faculty and student participants of this conference. Before I uh, move on, let me um, introduce the keynote speaker of the day, Dr. Pratik, who's the assistant professor from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Bits Pilani, Pilani campus. Pratik works, uh, has been working there and is uh, still uh, working there with Bits Pilani. And to give a brief, uh, uh, what to say, brief uh, uh, input into his uh, credentials. To begin with, is a recipient of two Fulbright Fellowships, the Fulbright Nehru Postdoctoral Fellowship at Northwestern University uh, during the year 20, uh, 2021 to 22, and the Fulbright Fellowship at Yale University in 2010 uh, to 11. He's completed his uh, PhD in theater studies at the University of Queensland, Australia in 2018. And he wrote his PhD in collaboration with the University of Oxford, England and Humboldt University, Germany, where he spent semesters as a PhD uh, scholar, visiting scholar. His research interests, what I understand from reading his profile is mainly theater, theater studies, which includes folk, street, and almost all the prominent uh, writers like Bresh, Ibsen, Indian theater, post-colonial theaters. It's so wonderful and so it stands out you know, for its uh, speciality. Uh, his research interest also is there in Indian literature, comic studies, eco-criticism, gender studies, gothic, digital humanities and film studies. That's quite an array of uh, research interests. Uh, Dr. Pradik has also published in several national and international journals on all these uh, areas of interest and should say particularly that he is uh, published in the South Asian Review Journal of Graphic Novels and Comics, the Australasian Drama Studies and Brescia book. 
He's also contributed encyclopedia articles, book chapters, and published his monograph, Brecht in India, The Poetics and Politics of Transcultural Theater in 2021, published by Routledge. Uh, Pratik has also been having a distinguished uh, teaching career when he taught humanities at, uh, I mean, at, uh, even as he's uh, teaching humanities now at Bits Pilani's has had previous experience uh, teaching literatures and English at colleges and under the University of Delhi, uh, then uh, Center for English Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Even he has worked briefly at the University of Queensland as a drama tutor interned as an assistant artistic director at Queensland Shakespeare Ensemble. And even for a short while, uh, uh, Dr. Pratik uh, taught courses on world literature and modern Indian uh, theater at Isaram University, Amravati. And uh, while researching also, uh, even as a postdoctorate uh, Fulbright fellow, he has delivered class lectures. And above all, he has also written and directed a number of theater skits and street plays. Uh, personally, you know, I was uh, slightly interested to read your skits and also get to view your street plays. Dr. Pratik has also been uh, invited to many talks and, of course, a recipient to many awards uh, to particularly mention uh, the Fulbright Nehru Postdoctoral Fellowship at Northwestern University and many awards for best paper awards from international universities. So these, this is a very brief uh, uh, profile of our distinguished keynote speaker. And we are waiting anxiously and excitedly to listen to the keynote address on the 2023 Nobel Laureate Yoon Forger. And the keynote speech is titled Ordinary Spenders Yoon Fosse's aesthetic discourse on world literature. May I once again welcome you, Dr. Pratik, and invite you to deliver the keynote address. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bina, ma'am, uh, for inviting me and for this amazing, awesome uh, introduction. Uh, maybe I can start by sharing my PPT slides and yes. then I'll begin. Is it uh, visible? Yes, it's visible. OK, great. Oh, so all of you can see this is the title. So I will start with the title. And I'm also grateful to Priya Darshini, madam, for her help with uh, online logistics. And I hope all the participants here get to benefit from this talk one way or the other. And one day, as ma'am said, we get a chance to have a hands-on in person Okay, theater workshop with some of you. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, so let me begin then. So let me first of all set the stage for what exactly is coming so that we know since we are talking about Nobel Prize, it's not a bad idea to start with what are the challenges now because the challenges have evolved, okay, or they have changed. They have become a little bit different from, from what it was in 2022. In 2023, we have a different challenge, especially when it comes to the Nobel Prize. So you can see I have this quotation on my slide. This is April 2023, uh, and this quotation is by Yuval Harari, and this came, he ended up writing in an article which came out immediately after the enormous success of Chat GPT. And he has written, as you can see, AI has gained some remarkable abilities to manipulate and generate language, whether with words, sounds, or images. AI has thereby hacked the operating system of our civilization. 
Although intimidated after reading this article by Harari, a historian, I took these words of Harari with a pinch of salt, as I knew deep down that there are still certain bastions of resistance, and one such is world literature, and the other one is the Nobel Prize. So, world literature is one of the last human realms where the theater of dreamers unfolds. A boundless stage where human minds can design the world the way they imagine. To make this imaginative world exist, one must think not only beyond the existing creative boundaries, but also beyond the AI operating system. So we have to understand that the challenges I was trying to underline has changed. Today I am speaking on the 2023 Nobel Prize winner in literature, Yun Fossa on Norwegian writer whose writing offers a view of one such limitless creative venture. Now to understand the aesthetic composition of Fosse's writing in this talk, I'm going to focus on how Fossa connects with the history of realistic and naturalistic traditions established by modern writers. One. Second, the way he derives from his, from them through his innovative style. And finally, how he articulates the unsable. So there is this tag which is connected to Fossa that he is a writer who can articulate the unsable. So in my talk, I will engage with what it means by unsable and how Fossa ends up articulating this unsable. Okay, while engaging with this history of connection, so I'm looking at the history of connection so that you understand how the Nobel Prize winners are reflecting on world literature, I will limit myself with these three writers. I have already written the name of these three writers. One is Franz Kafka, second is Samuel Beckett, and the third one is Henrik Ibsen. Okay, so this is what I will end up doing. So let me also underline one more thing before I begin. When it comes to Samuel Beckett, I am, will be limiting myself in this lecture how Fossa engages with Beckett's representation of the unknown. Okay, and unknown as, as some of you already know, I am sure some of you have already gone through waiting for Godot, you will find that unknown is there in the form of Godot, who never appears. Now we can only think whether Godot is a person, who is this Godot, we have no idea about this Godot because he never comes. Okay, so how the representation of the unknown in Beckett gets rewritten in Fossa, that is what I will look at as I move on into this lecture, that is one. Second writer who I will be engaging with is Kafka and how in Kafka's work, we look at the loss of individuality. A classic example of this loss of individuality or by individuality here I mean human form is of course Metamorphosis by Kafka. But this thing can also be seen in the case of another novel by Kafka, it's called The Trial, where the clerk, a bank clerk is, is caught between the titans as he is accused of a criminal act and throughout the novel we never find out um, in fact the bank clerk never finds out why he has been accused and what led him to this juncture so i will be so you will find that something similar happens when it comes to fossa and i will give you examples of how it works out how of course it is very kafka -esque. But at the same time, Fosso give, Fossa gives it his own turn. That is what I will um, get to engage with. And the final thing which I will engage with is Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen, another Norwegian writer. Uh, Ibsen has been a, a, a founding, um, um, a, a permanent fixture when it comes to Fossa, in the sense that Fossa keeps going back to the way Ibsen write his writing especially his early writing is often termed as naturalistic. And I am not only interested in the naturalistic part of Fossa's writing, but at the same time, how Fossa ends up including one particular section in almost all his plays. And this section is called the discussion section. 
Now, just just to introduce this discussion section, let me give you, uh, let me explain a little bit about it. When we are dealing with a, a well-made play, generally a well-made play is a play that appeared before the rise of modern realism. We always thought that this well-made play has three parts. What are the three parts? The first part is called exposition. The second part is called situation. And the third part is called resolution. So there is always some kind of a solution that will come in the case of a well-made play. Okay, And we know most of the Bollywood movies okay, and melodrama, a form of theater, okay, they follow this well-made structure. So there is always a solution. Imagine a Bollywood movie in the end, finally the hero will win. So that there is a solution. He manages to conquer, uh, uh, conquer the, the villain and this is how he wins. So that is a well-made play. Well, what Ibsen ended up doing when it comes to a well-made play, he changed the last part of the well-made play. Okay, so when it comes to Ibsen or Ibsen's play, we find this play has again a three part structure. The first part begins with exposition, second part is situation, but the third part is no more resolution. But the third part is what? It is discussion. So what Fossa does in his plays, he also includes the third part, discussion. Of course, the first two parts are not exactly there in the case of Fossa. But one can very clearly see that the discussion is very important when it comes to Fossa's plays. And this is, I will argue that this is Fossa's homage to Ibsen. That is what, um, uh, uh, these are some of the things I will engage with in this play. So even before I begin, just to um, give you a little bit of idea of who is Fossa, where he comes from, and also insight in the, into the politics of the Nobel Prize, let me show you a video and uh, this video just let me show you this video i guess all of you can see this video now, uh, I mean, as I show you this video, I just want you to notice two things as you as you uh, listen to this video. One, I want you to notice the reason. This is called Nobel Prize citation. That is, in this citation, the, the one who is announcing or the one who is come proclaiming um, Fossa as the Nobel Prize winner, he also provides the reason why he has been chosen. And generally, this reason is provided in a line or two. In a couple of lines, you end up providing the reason what inspired the Nobel Prize Committee to choose any Nobel Prize winner. So I just want you to notice that what is the reason that has been provided in this video. That is one thing I want you to notice. And second thing which I want to notice is the reaction, is Fossa's reaction to the news that he has been proclaimed as the 2023 Nobel Prize winner for literature. So I want you to notice both these things. The Nobel Prize in Literature for 2023 is awarded to the Norwegian author Jon Fosse for his innovative plays and prose which give voice to the unsayable. I've just spoken to Jon Fosse on the phone um, not every laureate believes me when I make the call, but he was prepared to have confidence until one o'clock. He was driving on the countryside at Sognefjord, north of Bergen in Norway, and um, we had the opportunity to start speaking about practical matters and the Nobel Week in December. Ja, i stora och känner mig väl kanske lite matt, men jag såg då väldigt glad för den stora ära, för att säga det sånn. Jeg har jo vært inne i diskusjonene om Nobelprisen i ti år, tror jeg nå. Så jeg er litt vant med den spenningen som er rundt det, men jeg er vant med å ikke få den. Så at jeg da skulle få... 
Now, now you can notice one thing that he has been waiting for this for such a long time and I, I got it this year was unexpected. So just remember this word unexpected. Oh, no, no, they, they come you went up on me, for say this one. Nei, det hadde jeg aldri trodd på, altså. Og det var, jeg hadde jo ikke en gang noen særlige ambisjoner. Jeg hadde lyst til å, å skrive og kunne livnære meg på et eller annet vis av denne skrivingen min, da. Og all medgang som måtte komme til å kunne gjøre imot med glede. Men jeg hadde ikke forventet noe, ikke så veldig mye, da. Men bortsett for det av meg selv, at det skulle ikke gi meg, jeg skulle holde på. Og så hadde jeg nå et stort håp om at det skulle et forlag ville gi det ut. Ok, perfekt. Let me come back to my slides and we will discuss this thing. Okay, now these are the two standard reactions. Okay, and I'm just talking about the Nobel Prize uh, Committee and when they announce the result or the name of the winner and they call this winner, these are the two standard reactions from these Nobel Prize winners. So I'm just underlining and I will try to tell you how it is different in the case of Fossa. Okay, now I call this first reaction as tear and fire. Okay, and I'm calling it tear and fire. The reason is very simple because when these Nobel Prize winners listen that they got the Nobel Prize, they are literally on fire in the sense they are overwhelmed and, you know, the emotions start flowing either in the form of tear or their body language changes. That is what you will get to see. In fact, sometimes I think that at this very point that, you know, William Wordsworth uh, advised to poets that Poetry is in a spontaneous overflow of emotions recollected in tranquility is remained unheard when it comes to these Nobel Prize winners. So one is this one. And second kind of a reaction I cause this reaction as is Prezzatura reaction. What do I mean by that? It means some of these Nobel Prize winners, what they end up doing, they show some kind of a non-challenge. What does it mean? It means they behave as if they have not, you know, they have not invested too much of energy into their work. They just behave in a very offended manner, okay, as if oh, it's nothing basically as far as this, as their writing is concerned. So what I am suggesting now is FOSA does not fall in either of these categories, either tear and fire reaction category or espresso to the reaction category. What I am um, considering Fossa's reaction as unexpected reaction. And I underlined that particular point in the video when he said unexpected. So, and I'm calling it as unexpected because of two reasons. First, it doesn't fall in the category of the first two standard reactions. Second, he has been, that is Fossa has been expecting the price for the last 10 years. He found this year's decision unexpected. In literary studies, especially in short story writing, this kind of a style which exhibits the tense tug of war between expected and unexpected is called compression. Since as readers or listeners, we find both the pressure and the release. So I'm just trying to tell you here, this is style which is called compression is innate, is natural to FOSA. So right now his reaction is not only there when uh, when somebody is telling him that he has won the Nobel Prize. It is also there when you go through his writing, you will find there will be a pressure at one point in time in his in his place. And suddenly by the end of the same scene, uh, there is some kind of a release again in the next scene. There is this pressure and again in the um, same scene, there will be some kind of a release. 
so, and this uh, this game of release and pressure generally you do not find in the case of playwrights this is evident in a story um, a short story writers but not in playwright so this is this distinct quality that is what i am trying to argue okay one more thing additionally the adjective unexpected also draws our attention to the thematic composition of sosa's writing where the unexpected is a regular refrain according to fossa this unexpected has been hidden in the ordinary but we have not noticed it fossa highlights the unexpected loss in the ordinary thus empowering the ordinary to an extent where it can replace the supernatural so in fossa ordinary is the supernatural ordinary is enchantment ordinary is not something you can sideline or you can throw out but it is very very important so for example imagine that after a hard day of work and i am thinking about the research scholars who are sitting or undergraduates and master students you go back to your house okay and your door is closed you press the doorbell okay and this doorbell the sound of the doorbell probably for for your parents is very ordinary but when it comes to fossa or in his place you will find this doorbell is a trigger is very important suddenly you will find he will give a, give this doorbell a different kind of a turn it will become so exotic this doorbell that you will be surprised by the novelty of the writer that is what you will get to see okay and that is one of the reasons is since ordinary is not so ordinary in the case of fossa i call this lecture as ordinary splendors so the art of articulating the ordinary and unexpected not not as separate entities but as an oxymoron that is ordinary and splendor or ordinary and unexpected art together fused together in in fossa is captured by the nobel prize committee when they said in the nobel prize citation that fossa gives voice to the unsayable so you see this is what they ended up saying okay fossa gives voice to the unsayable okay now let me explain what do we mean by this unsayable okay now there are two meanings or two things which you have to understand when we are dealing with this unsayable what are those two things one now you see that whenever we are dealing with fossa as i explained fossa empowers the ordinary that has devolved to the point that it has become unsayable now i also want you to understand often what happens this word unsayable is often misquoted or misunderstood okay why because sometimes we read unsayable as a negative emotion or a negative expression that is something that has been censored or something that has become a taboo so for example in front of our parents there are certain things which we can say and some certain things which we can't say so those things which we can't say we will try to call these things as unsayable but this is not the meaning of unsayable when it comes to the fossa fossa here unsayable is something which we do not care about or we don't give a fig for which means as i have given the example of the doorbell doorbell is the unsayable we we have forgotten about the existence of the doorbell sometimes another example as i think about it imagine that you are using gmail okay and every day you go and ch uh, check your inbox and in order to reach the point where you can check your inbox you have to provide the username and the password sometimes what happens that you even don't have to think you have a muscle memory and this muscle memory will type the password so the password in your case if you have been using the same password for a very long duration has become ordinary so what fossa will do will look at this ordinary and he exoticizes it that is what he ends up doing he gives it a magic this password won't be you know just an ordinary password when it comes to fossa but it will become some kind of a magical password a magical refrain that is what you will get to see okay so please remember that second thing which we have to understand when it comes to the meaning of this word unsayable when we are dealing with fossa how fossa articulates this ordinary splendor okay or how we articulate these ordinary splendors 
And what I am arguing, and I will give you, I will show, in fact, from Fossa that his writing is an example of minimalistic prose. And I think this minimalistic prose which Fossa writes, no AI can really copy. And I will show you why it can't be copied. I, ha I have uh, taken a picture of some of the pages from one of his play. It's called Christmas Song. Christmas tree song, actually, that is the full title of this play. And I will show you some, some pages from it just to argue how this writing is unparalleled. Okay, so this is one. Okay, now let me come to his first play. Okay, and this is a play which, which Fossa wrote uh, between 1992 and 1993. And this is his first play. Okay, he has uh, written works before this, but not a play. So this is the first play and you can look at the title. Someone is going to come. That is the title. Now, by, lo uh, by looking at the title itself, I mean, at least that is what I felt as if this is some kind of a, you know, a, a twist on William Beckett's Waiting for Godot. So there, somebody is waiting and here somebody is going to come. So you can see there is some kind of a, you know, a dialogue which is going on between Fossa and William Beckett. In fact, in an interview, Fossa talks about how uh, William Beckett is very important. Okay, that is what we get to see when we are dealing with Fossa. Okay, now let me let me just quickly give you a quick summary of this play before I start analyzing this play. Okay, now when we are dealing with the summary of this play, what happens in this play? There is a couple, man and woman. They go to a seaside location, and in this seaside location, they buy a house. And this house is far away from the civilization. So nobody is living around the house. Okay, so they want to live or they want to enjoy a solitary existence. That is what they want to do. Now, when it comes to the man, uh, when we are dealing with this couple, the man throughout the play does not have a name. This man is called he and the woman is called she. So the character names are he and she okay and then now this is the first day in the house both of them are in the garden they are talking about the beauty of the garden beauty of the house beauty of the ambience and the sea which is not far away from their house okay and enjoying their uh, solitariness suddenly one thought breaks them down and that thought is what will happen if somebody comes and disrupt they are solitary peace. And now throughout the play, there is this feeling, okay, there is this, um, um, you know, angst, there is this anxiety that somebody is going to come and, you know, disturb them. Okay, and then unlike William Beckett, and I, I will, I will talk a little bit about Beckett now, okay, where this somebody in the form of Godo never comes while in Fossa, this somebody will come. Okay. And this somebody is, let me, let me explain this part. Um, so had this play been the theater of the absurd, because that is what we call William Beckett's play, the playwright would have given either a grotesque form to this unknown, as we notice in the case of Eugene Ionesco's play, Rhinosaurus where the unknown is represented in the form of rhinos and the act of people transforming into rhinos. So that is what we get to see in the case of Eugene Ionesco. While in Samuel Beckett uh, represents the unknown through the act of postponement as the movement of meeting Godo keeps getting deferred. But here Fossa brings out the unknown in an ordinary form. So you see Neither this uh, unknown is supernatural as you find in the case of Ionesco, nor it is missing, okay, and nor it is invisible. But what it is, it is ordinary, okay. And who is this ordinary person who arrives and disrupts the peace of this couple? This person turns out to be the previous owner of the house from whom they have bought this house. This previous owner, owner who is called man throughout the play lives around the house and suggests regular visits to the family, especially to she whom he liked. The man's visit leads to a showdown between he and she 
as he suspects going on a naturalistic jealousy which you find in the case of uh, Ibsen okay once he comes down they decide not to let the man ruin their solitary happiness by not allowing him to enter the house so they have taken a decision in the play very early on in the play they have decided they will not allow anybody especially this man to enter the house however scene after scene we notice a war going on between the fear that someone is at the door and the discussion section that follows in which she and he decide whether he should be allowed or not. So although they have decided very early on, they will not allow the man to enter the house. Throughout the play, there is this discussion that goes on and on whether he should be allowed or whether he should not be allowed. So this is totally Ibsen, very naturalistic. Despite the fact there is this fear, uh, you can call it this fear resembles Beckett. Okay, and this fear is the fear of the knock. Okay, and you will see that knock uh, throughout throughout uh, this play that somebody is at the door and knocking, knock. So I was giving you the example of the doorbell. Instead of the doorbell here, we have a door knock. Okay, so they hear the sound of the knock and this this knock is no more an ordinary knock but this is an very exoticized a knock where the inmates of the house really do not know what needs to be done and rather than opening the door they are having a discussion whether they should open the door or not okay so let me uh, move forward and just underline one more thing here often the husband without knowing in this play without knowing the full context blames the wife as it happens in the case of Ibsen's A Doll's House. The play, um, Fossa's play, beautifully captures this anxiety or angst through the sound of knocks. The commonplace sound of a knock on the door is now magnified, echoing through the narrative like a spectral presence, haunting the couple's life in the unfolding drama. Despite the tense moments of jealousy and paranoia, as he suspected she of liking the man, the play ends on an unexpected note as we find she and he again in the garden reminiscing about the house's beauty. Okay, so this is the last scene. This ending can probably be called cyclical as the play's last scene resembles the first before the arrival of the man. So the last scene of the play and the first scene of the play are very, very similar. Okay, not surprisingly, this ending reminds one of the cyclical ending of the waiting for Bodo, where again, something similar is happening as characters are trapped in the world. However, unlike Beckett, that is unlike waiting for Bodo, Fossa's world has a constant fear of the unknown. So if you remember, in the case of waiting for Godo, Estrogen and Vladimir, they were not afraid of Godo. They were coming time and again and sitting on the mountain. Here, there is this fear of the unknown. So you can see, despite the fact this play resembles Beckett, but it is at the same time, it also departs from Beck Beckett. Okay, so it's a kind of a reflection on Beckett without being totally back it like so understand the difference here okay now there is one more thing according to me this fear of the unknown which you find in the case of fossa is fossa's homage to kafka as like kafka who stripped his characters of their humanity as we notice in the case of grigor samsa in metamorphosis we find the same reframe however unlike Samsa or Grigor Samsa in Metamorphosis, who quickly accepts his transformation and tries to go on with his life as a bug. Fossa's characters are unable to adjust into their new milieu. They are always on trial, like Joseph K. in Kafka's novel, The Trial, who despite being an ordinary bank employee, is arrested for some unspecified crime. 
Fossa articulates this inability of his characters to adjust as a universal phenomenon by dressing his characters in pronouns. So you see what I am arguing here is that, okay, that Fossa's in almost all his plays, you rarely find any character with a name. Most of these characters are in the form of pronouns. Okay, he, she, they, in this way, these characters will emerge. Okay, and by making his characters universal, he is also looking at how, uh, looking at the condition of humans, not only in Norway, but throughout the world. So, so you see that he is reflecting on the world, okay, through the pronouns rather than um limiting is the approach of the characters by assigning them either some norwegian name or some swedish name that is what he is trying to do okay so let me since i have been talking about this particular play someone is going to come it's not a bad idea to have a quick look at the trailer of this place that will give you a little bit of an idea so let me again show you one one um, video and this is here we go Or maybe there is someone there already. Maybe someone is in the house. And no one is going to come. There. And notice how they are talking about the knock. Okay, knock is like here in the play is very important. In fact, if we have to rewrite the name of this play, we can also call this play as knock knock. That is what it can be called, okay? Or knocks. That is another way of looking at this play, okay? Did you hear that? Was it footsteps? It was something. Uh, I think I heard footsteps. Perhaps we can keep each other company. Do you want to? No. <laughs> no, no. All that bad, I didn't tell you. <laughs> Okay, so now let me come to my um, uh, the, the second second play where again we find something similar and this play is called Susanna. Okay, a very interesting play by by Fossa and Susanna is uh, uh, I have no idea whether you know it or not. Susanna here uh, refers to the wife of Henry Gibson. So this is like, you will feel as if he's writing some kind of a biography of uh, Susanna Ibsen. But here he's trying to show a very different kind of a world of Susanna Ibsen. When the this is very interesting I have come across. Okay, what, what we encounter, we encounter three incarnations of Susanna Ibsen. That is the wife of Henrik Ibsen. These three Susannas find themselves trapped in distinct time zones. So we have three Susannas. So who are these three Susanna? One is old Susanna. Okay. Second is middle-aged Susanna. And the third one is young Susanna. So Fossa shows these three time zones by creating these three characters or three incarnations of the same character. So we have Susanna as an old woman. We have Susanna as a middle-aged woman. And we have Susanna as a young woman. 
despite their shared identity each woman is maroon in perpetual anticipation of ibsen now you see these three women are located in different time zones okay because we is young middle and the old okay one one common thread that runs across the entire play all three of them are waiting for ibsen who never appears in the play so there is this i mean when you when you uh, read this play you will find that all three of them without noticing the existence of the other susanna are at the dining table waiting for ibsen to come okay the first susanna is at the dining table and the play explains to us this is the dining table not in the house but in a restaurant and she is on a date with ibsen so you can see this is young susanna who is on a date with ibsen okay and they are not still married but ibsen is late and she is waiting for ibsen to appear in this restaurant so that they can talk so this is the first susanna and then we come across the second susanna who is middle aged susanna okay and now this middle aged susanna is already married to ibsen they have a child and this child is 7 years old okay and this child has a birthday and this susanna is again waiting for the child and ibsen to come and finally we come across the third one okay and this is old susanna who is old okay and she is reflecting on her time with ibsen so you see this this kind of a play okay um where ibsen is absent okay is important because ibsen's absence grants these three women identical yet divergent they are like one and the same character but they are also located in different time zones so they are also divergent the stage to contemplate their shared journey with him unveiling an exploration of circumstances and motives so this is what i was trying to explain earlier the discussion section which you find in the case of ibsen what he has done um fossa has done he has multiplied this discussion section by 3 because we have, we have three susannas now okay and these three susannas are deliberating or reflecting on their time with ibsen so you see this is how uh you get to see all the three three writers influence one in the form of a discussion section because this is three multiplied um he has multiplied th uh, it by three discussion section one then all three women are waiting for ibsen who is like godo who never appears and then these three women despite the fact they are one and the same but they are trapped in different time zones which means they are very similar to kafka's characters who are also trapped in time no matter how hard they try to break out of it they never break out so you see these three writers how they are coming together in the case of this particular play okay so let me move on to another now this is uh, i think one of the most beautiful plays of uh, of uh, fossa and this is i think one of the shortest plays this is only five pages okay and um, just to just to explain so far almost all of fossa's plays have been published okay and they have come out in six volumes so this play is from volume 6 so this is a volume okay i have just uh, clicked the picture of it that's all okay so you see the play is the second last play so second last play in the last volume which is play 6 it's called christmas tree song this so just to give you an idea how fossa writes and what i called as minimalistic writing okay how it resembles how it looks like let me take you to the first page of this play of this five page play i have three pages i have two pages here and then we will discuss now you see this play is written in the form of a monologue there is a man who enters with a christmas tree more a bush than a tree and a christmas tree stand now almost all his plays are like this only except the naturalistic play for example what uh, the example of a naturalistic play someone is going to come where the sentences are long but after the naturalistic period is over when it comes to fossa most of his writing is like this this is called minimalistic prose so you can see how lyrical it this is like more like a poem this is more like poetry rather than prose okay so 
Now you see there is a pause. So it is very dramatic in that sense. Quite short pause. So there we were. Again there is a pause. We, I, we were there. Now, now you must be thinking why something like this is happening. Why this guy is talking in this way. Now this man as you go through the play you will find this man is extremely excited right now. He is overwhelmed by the fact that he has bought a Christmas tree. And not only he has bought a Christmas tree, but he has also come to his house with a Christmas tree stand. And now he is about to put the tree on the stand and he is about to reflect on the Christmas tree. What will happen to the Christmas tree? Okay, that is what he is about to do. Okay, so that is why throughout this play, the excitement is shown through this language. So if you look at the next page of this play, you will find how he says even Christmas. Now you see, even in order to say Christmas, he is so excited, he is unable to even say Christmas. You see how many lines go into even he speaking Christmas. Kr, 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 kri, kris, Christmas. Okay, so he is excited. He is excited by what? He is excited by the fact that he owns a Christmas tree. The excitement is only about the tree not any kind of a metaphor which is connected to the tree. So he is not reading this Christmas tree as a kind of a symbol of, of something, uh, you know, some, some spiritual thing or as a savior. He is only reading it as a kind of, you know, uh, just a tree. That is how he ends up reading this particular, uh, you know, this particular text. Okay. so. Now, just to conclude this play, uh, this this lecture, okay. As we explored Fossa's web of connections with literary giants such as Samuel Beckett, Franz Kafka, and Henrik Ibsen, we found that despite relying on these authors, Fossa has a distinct style. Fossa, a writer unafraid to deviate from established traditions, has redefined the boundaries of storytelling. Nonetheless, we can hear in his works the echoes of Beckett's existentialist ponderings, the Kafkaesque labyrinth of temporal intricacies, and the resonances of Ibsen's dramatic craftsmanship. In delving into the unsayable, Fossa transcends the boundaries of conventional expression, injecting enchantment into the everyday. I guess. There is no better way to conclude this talk than by using Fossa's lens, which celebrates the magic of everyday life, to understand the plight of some of my own students who have traveled from warmer regions of South India into what they call freezing Pilani. As I look at some of my students and how they are decked up with serpentine layers and layers of clothes, Sometimes it isn't easy to see their faces hidden behind the scarf, which is as big as a blanket. I, a seasoned winter veteran, started seeing the magic in the ordinary as I see them layered up, bundled up. Okay, no doubt a single student from South India can enchant the ordinary in North India by bundling up. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Pratik. It was wonderful. I should say, uh, for us, it was more than they expected. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. And, and your conclusion again is a beauty. beauty. Thank yes, you. move on. Thank you, sir, for an insightful and extensive session. The visual aids were a uh, added treat for us. I'm sure it speaks for everybody who are yet to present. Uh, so uh, let us begin with our student presentation.
are there questions Kritika, are there questions coming up yes ma'am Dr. Pratik, would you be open to answering a few questions from our student presenters and audience? Yes, yes. Of course. Is there any questions? As we wait for the questions, uh, Dr. Pratik, let me clarify. Now, you were talking about the place, uh, uh, talking about the unsayable. Uh, this, I mean, honestly, I have not read this place. Let me confess. Uh, do they have a closure? Is does, Do the place have a closure? Yes, some of his plays have a closure. But sometimes what happens is closure is cyclical. OK, like what happens in the case of Beckett? Like waiting for Godot in Beckett, you will find that Godot never appears. And again, they go back, okay, and look for Godot. While here, when it comes to Fossa, they have found the Godot over here. Just to just to put it in in Beckett's word, okay. But still, the play will not end. If they have found Godot, there will be a search for another person. That is what you will get to see. Yeah. Thank you. But the, the, so what I was trying to say earlier, the compression, the pressure and the release. So there is pressure, first the search for Godo, and then there is release. Critics have called him as the writer of serenity. Okay, his plays are very serene in that sense. At least you get to have something. If not 100%, but at least you get 20% of what you are expecting. So that makes him a serene writer. That is what he is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Kritika, please coordinate. If there are students who are there to ask questions, can you please coordinate? Participants can post their questions via the chat box and will be presented to Dr. Pratik. Participants can post their questions via the chat box and will be presented to Dr. Pratik. In fact, let me just add one more thing uh, to what you asked, madam. Yes. There is one play um, by, by uh, him. It's called Rambuku. This okay. one, the part one. This is exactly like waiting for Godot. Okay, okay. exactly like waiting for Godot. Rambuku here is Godot. Okay. The only difference between Godot and Rambuku is in the case of Beckett, we knew Godot is a person. In the case of Rambuku, we do not know whether Rambuku is a person or the name of the place. Okay, but whatever it is, whether a person or a name of a place, both of them are utopian. And then in the middle of the play, Rambuku arrives. Again, there is no clarity whether Rambuku is again a place has arrived or the person has arrived. But whatever has arrived, that has made the characters in the play very happy. That is what we get to see. Mm -hmm. So again, as I was trying to great world writers like Kafka or Beckett or Hendrik So can you specify any of the unsayable that you did tell about? You gave a wonderful example of the knock. Uh, but even when in the Nobel Prize citation, when they have awarded him for saying the unsayable, uh, what is that he may have said to the world, which was not said before? Hmm. So, so see, there are certain expressions. There are certain feelings. Okay, which no matter how hard we try to articulate, we are not able to articulate. Okay, so what he is doing, I mean, as I was trying to, um, in, in, my, in my closing, what I was trying to say, now there is this feeling, imagine 
which is there in the in the heart of a person who is coming from warmer regions in south india to pelani when yeah. he experiences yes. cold for the first time there is no way anybody can articulate that feeling other than i mean what when you go through these plays uh, then you find he he knows how but this must be so christmas the, the way he says christmas okay because through this song because one is you sing a song but he is not after the words what he is saying the excitement can't be represented through the meanings of the words they can be expressed through the way you articulate these words and that is why this even to say christmas he has spent two pages in order to say christmas in a play which has only five pages so you can understand this is how he is saying the answer fine friends i mean uh, really interesting at i think i should pick the book early and read just out of curiosity dr pratik uh, did you read his books even before he won this nobel prize yeah. yes i did oh. so that yeah. must have so was it expected or unexpected for you for me it was unexpected okay i unexpected because this year i thought maybe there is another writer his name is haruki murakami a japanese writer oh, i was really you know rooting for him that he should win but uh, as it turned out this guy who has been on the long list for such a long time won it but whatever fosse is a great writer no doubts about it great 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 to hear about that so there seem no questions there seem to be no questions coming in or uh kritika can you give us yes ma'am uh some idea about it are there any questions coming in uh there is a question no questions okay there is a question there is a question okay so uh is there any comparison between fosse's work and past nobel prize winner gunas book of uh, uh, fosse's work and the past nobel prize winner gunas book uh what is the name of the uh, nobel prize winner uh gurnas oh uh, uh, i have no idea uh, i mean uh, i have not done the competitive analysis there actually so i am not very sure whether i would be able to say more on it thank you sir yeah because i can i can think about some other nobel prize winners okay we which our uh, forces writing is in dialogue with these nobel prize winners okay for example um, hanke peter hanke the one who got the nobel prize okay his writing is very bactian and in one sense there is one strain which is very similar in the case of forse but i am not very sure about the writer you have just mentioned are the plays staged also widely ha i have yes. they performed yes outside yes. norwegia also yes a lot actually okay okay lot in fact what fosse does fosse ensures that he goes for some of these screenings especially in europe okay i was um, when i was doing my research into it i found that um hardly there are some continents where which are left where fosse has not been screened but i know for sure in india fosse has not been staged there is a question in the chat box uh, kritika can you read it yes fosse has two languages one is readers response theory and the other is silent language what is the silent language contributes okay uh, what is this uh, sorry if somebody can provide me a little bit more context what does it mean by silent language okay so uh, i mean Maybe just to say a little, uh, little bit about it uh, just to provide a little bit background for you okay now when we are dealing with norway now first thing you have to understand in norway there are two dialects with that go on these are two national languages basically okay so imagine that whatever our language is okay there are two dialects of languages which are established in norway okay one is considered a mainstream dialect or mainstream language 
the other is considered more like a minority uh, language for sites in the minority language he not write in the mainstream language okay so often what people will argue that is for says politics that is rather than writing in the mainstream uh, language he is writing in the minority language well in an interview fosse reflected on it and he said that is not the reason so there is no politics in writing in the minority language because when he was uh, brought up he was taught only the minority language since he understand the minority language better than the mainstream language and that is one of the reasons he writes in that okay so i am just thinking the question is about this not about any other thing yeah okay so there is another question uh this question was asked by Rachel do you think faith plays a major role in forces writing and does that resonate with the norwegian people hence is a norwegian writer okay so forse for a very long duration forse currently is i think 64 okay and he started writing um, uh, since the age of 12 so you see for a very long time he has been writing from 12 till 64 he has been writing okay and he is not uh, he has not written his write uh, limited his writing only to plays but he has written novels he has written short stories essays and other things so um, for a long duration of his career he has stayed as an atheist that is one thing you have to understand only recently he embraced catholicism okay so the faith which you are associating okay if you are looking for if this faith is religious probably we can find it now in Fosse's work but Fosse has not written any play in the recent past he has Uh, quite far back, um, will be focusing his or investing his energies into another literary form. That is what he ended up saying. So, faith in the religious sense was never a part of Fosse's parlance, especially when he was focusing on plays. Uh, while you can find some some something similar in the case of his novels. There are other questions as well. Good morning, uh, Dr. Prithi. After Ravindrana Tagore, Indian writers have not succeeded in winning the Nobel Prize in literature. In your opinion, why do you think that is? I think we, we, we need to consult the Nobel Prize Committee why this is happening. I have no idea. Okay, because there is this long list. And I am not very sure whether any any Indian writer is in the long list at this point in time. I know one guy who has been in the list, as I was trying to explain earlier also. This guy is from Japan, Haruki Murakami. And I am sure some of you have already read Haruki Murakami. Murakami is amazing. So, um, I mean, if if one of us can write like Murakami, I am sure we will make it to the, to the long list. And also understand one, one more thing that Nobel Prize Committee has its own politics. Okay, and that is very important for us to understand. Okay, that at one point in time there was a discussion, and this discussion was on in 2021 and 2022 uh, um, uh, that Nobel Prize will bring bring out writers from the global south okay minority writers but again this time they have gone back on their words because this writer neither comes from the glo global south nor he comes from asia nor he comes from any minority thing okay so you, you really can't trust that is what my point ar argument would be There are questions in the chat box. Uh, Kritika, read them. Um, uh, Bhargavi has asked, what is the significance of the Norwegian background being represented? Can you please tell me, sir? Yeah, sure. So my argument would be his plays are very universal. OK. And they can be staged anywhere without even paying much attention to the Norwegian background. 
because um, you know his when when you come across when you read his plays people find we really do not know much about the location of the play okay so when the play opens you do not know whether it is morning you do not know whether it is afternoon you do not know and there is nothing like a stage directions what can be the scenery of this play you have no stage directions like that so you find yourself in a world which is timeless and since this world is timeless and then if you find yourself in a timeless world you try to make sense of this world through the names of the characters that is a general pattern in theater studies but here in the case of fossa even the names of the characters are pronounced okay which means there is no way you can find out which world it is so he is creating something which is very universal so my argument would be rather than limiting himself to uh, norway okay what he is creating he is giving us something which is universal which we can embrace even without thinking about the norwegian themes thank you sir the next question was asked by shruti so what are your views on how murakami portrays women in his books see i think i mean since we are talking about the the connect between uh, fossa and murakami okay and i am hoping since murakami is a part of a long list soon or later he also gets the nobel prize and that is like the focus of this conference okay i will say that one one similarity between fossa and murakami is the timelessness okay that we really do not know which world we are in this world is extremely as i said in the beginning remarks in the opening remarks that um, this world is a world of dreamers okay so for example if i am talking about murakami's one of his most acclaimed novel kafka on the shore okay this is like kafka on the shore you will feel as if we are uh, dealing with franz kafka but this is a different character in the novel kafka okay you find this character it's very difficult even to say who is this character okay what kind of a sexuality he represents whether this character is a man whether this character is a woman he is somewhere stuck somewhere in like in lot of worlds that is what you will get to see so when i am at least reading murakami it's very difficult okay for me to distinguish between men and women because of the the dream state of these characters okay so as a result okay when you are asking me how murakami portrays women in his works my my argument would be other than some of his novels okay in most of these novels it becomes difficult even to focus on these characters because these characters are just very skeleton what you are focusing on you are focusing on the plot the plot is so adventurous and it is moving so fast that you are really you really do not care about okay the yeah, the characters so in that sense murak what i am trying to argue here is murakami is very aristotelian that the focus is on the plot characters are skeleton so focus on the plot rather than focusing on the characters thank you sir for patiently answering all of queries we have all benefited greatly from this session once again thank we thank you for spending your valuable time with us thank you so thank you kritika thank you thank you thanks a lot madam let us now begin the student conference the first student presenter is ms julian mary m i repeat the first student presenter is ms julian mary m hi yes ma'am am i audible ma'am Hello. Yes. Yeah. 